You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Shoe and Show. Uh, it's Andy Polk with Jasmine in studio today. Hello, Hello guys. Hi Andy. Hello, how are you? Great. Awesome. Doing well today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is a continuation of conversations we had at our recent executive summit. Yeah. Um, where we had leaders and experts come and talk about all different changes happening to the industry. Jazz, one of the biggest things I think that continues to plague the industry is intellectual property issues. Yeah. It's like protecting designs, protecting brands from infringement, knockoffs, etc. Yeah. Right? And we put out an IP digest uh, every month uh, because of that. Every single month. <laughs> yeah. And we track all the patents and trademarks and logos and uh, all, the, all the many lawsuits where people yes. are suing someone. Uh, <laughs> often members suing other members, which is always interesting. Yes. <laughs> Um, but because th- this continue rise in issues with with knockoffs, and especially as you have um, you know online uh, retailers, especially large online third party retailers selling shoes, um, there's a verification kind of battle taking place out there, right? Yeah. It's like making sure that the shoe is what it is mm-hmm. when the consumer buys it; they're not buying a knockoff. And so um, we invited uh, some folks from Nike to attend the summit. Who do we have come? We had Margot mm-hmm. Fowler, who is the VP and Chief um, IP Officer at Nike, Big and then time. yep, and also the VP of Innovation and Special Project at Nike, which is Mark Smith. Yeah, and so th- the idea was uh, Matt Priest, our president and CEO, had a conversation with him at the summit about. Um, it, it, I think Nike takes a different approach. Obviously, they're a huge behemoth in our industry and have a lot of funds to, to make sure that they're tackling this issue. And they're probably knocked off more than anybody else. But um, yeah. how strategically they're starting to take a look, not at just in product, but at protecting the product through the process, right? right. From the design all the way through. Um, so um, for this segment, we're, uh, we're going to jump into the conversation and listen to some innovations occurring inside Nike and then how – how, from an IP perspective, they protect those interesting designs and innovative product that are coming out. So with that, Blake, just cue the clip, please. We're very excited to have both Margo and Mark here to talk about global design, innovation, and how we protect it. It's more and more prevalent. We've talked about it this morning. We talked about it with Ambassador Froman and others, David Kahn. And as, as a FDRA member, companies work hard to design and produce and deliver billions of pairs of shoes every year. Two and a half billion, I think, were imported last year. And many of our members also sell brands that reach consumers and markets all over the world, as we all know. That's part of our mandate is to try and open up those marketplaces for our members. Weird. Our companies manage supply chains that span the globe. Uh, and we provide uh, our folks with hands-on familiarity of the significance of intellectual property and innovation. That's why we are actively participant, active participants in the USTR uh, discussion around uh, IP protection every year. And so we think it's so important to protect IP uh, for our industry as our members continue to incorporate a lot of cutting-edge technologies, many of which we displayed on Capitol Hill yesterday. And so my hope is that this conversation will help provide some insights and on design creation and what Nike's doing on design creation and how such an iconic brand approaches the issue of intellectual property and technology within your product. So let's let's get introductions out there. Let's start from, with you, Margo. Just who are you? What do you do at Nike? Tell us what your role is and how you, how you got to the company. Okay. Well, first, thank you so much for the invitation. I uh, appreciate everybody coming back from lunch. Um, <laughs> and uh, a few um, stragglers. I, yeah. <laughs> So I've been at um, Nike 18 years. Um, I'm a lawyer. I'm the chief IP officer. So right now, uh, in charge on the legal side of trademark, uh, copyright, um, did pa- pa- excuse me, patents, design patents, uh, IP transactions, anti-counterfeiting, and then also um, our mar- marketing and sports marketing functions on the legal side. Um, I've been at Nike, as I said, 18 years, uh, started, and I've called myself a utility lawyer. Um, I started out doing brand work, and I've done commercial work, and I've done compliance, and a whole bunch of other things. So every couple of years, I just kind of do something different. So, um, But I have to say, uh, 
you know, intellectual property, like the opportunity to protect, uh, you know, the, the intellectual property that people like Mark and others create is like by far the best uh, legal work you could do. So that's I me. believe it. I believe that's it. A little bit of me. What about you, Mark? Tell us what's your backstory, which is long and iconic to say the least. It's trouble. Uh, it's <laughs> going on 30 years uh, in, in, in product and design. Uh, started in apparel, went to footwear. I've done a number of different jobs around the, the brand, and I'm in currently in uh, innovation. That's my home. Uh, and uh, just making up weird stuff. I mean, that's what Love we do. It. So, uh, uh, but really, at the end, uh, partnering, uh, you know, again, to con control the, the spread of uh, fakes and un unreal stuff, not real stuff out there, and the partnerships that we, that we have, um, that, that's really important to us. I mean, we, we have a good time, and, and we get to have a good time because we have great partners who keep things legal and, and safe. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, good times had by all. Um, Let's talk about high-level picture of what innovation and intellectual property means at Nike, Margot, from your perspective. Kind of give us the lay of the land of what those two issues mean to the company. So um, at a high level, just you know, for people that they may know Nike as a brand, but may not know that um, you know, we were started by two innovators. Uh, one, Phil Knight, kind of a, as a business innovator, but his partner, uh, was was Bill Bowerman. Uh, Bill Bowerman was his track coach at the University of Oregon and was a consummate uh, inventor. You know, tinkering with you know famous at Nike, kind of the waffle iron to figure out what kind of soles to put on shoes. Uh, that's the genesis of the company. He was a patent uh, holder, um, and so that is kind of at the heart of everything that the company has done since then. Our current CEO is an a brilliant businessman, but he's a footwear designer. That's what his. That's what he started at. So, the connection between innovation and then, of course, intellectual property is really critical. Uh, at the you know at a high level, intellectual property is the opportunity to protect and enforce our competitive advantage. The exclusivity that you get by from intellectual property is what keeps you uh, special and relevant, so um, that's at the, at the high level what it means to us. Sure, Mark, you, on the innovation, crossroads of in innovation and intellectual property, you come from a different perspective, more on the innovation side, is, do you, how do you view it from that perspective? It's, it's very simple, really, for us. Uh, the way I uh, operate, and I represent a, a number of people in the group, but they don't all operate on my particular principles, but there are some very common things that I, I, I try and put out there as far as uh, blueprints for success in innovation. One of them is uh, first, best, and only. These three words. If you're the first to market or the first to do something, you're definitely innovating. If you're the best at it, you're probably innovating. If you're the only person or only brand doing something, you're innovating. So along, you know, it's a, it's a lineage from, uh, you know, Bill Bowerman, you know, trying to figure things out. And, and we look at it through that lens of first, best, and only. And, and uh, if you can get one of them right, then great. And if you can get all three of them together in something, you've really got something special. And the importance of, of, of owning that and the importance of the efforts, whether they're a day or 10 years of effort, uh, is very important to our business and to our, uh, you know, our, our blueprint for, you know, forward success. Got it. That makes sense. Can you, either of you or both of you, give Give the audience a sense of kind of the types of innovation that's happening at Nike right now. Yeah, let's just give away all the trade secrets right away. <laughs> I try, I try. <laughs> no. How about no? Next question. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'll say that there's some really cool stuff, and I got to time travel back in time to today to actually come and speak with you about it. <laughs> But some of the, um, I think, the stuff that's out there. Yeah, current um, stuff that's out there. We, uh, I think, um, some of the airbag innovation that we have right now that's out there. I mean, you can see what I'm wearing. But this is the, the reason I wore these today was for the. We've got this this enormous airbag in the back of our shoes, which is both kind of an awesome innovation from in terms of design, but also performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just doing a lot more. We're putting out a lot more. There's, there's yeah. things that you can see, and then there's things yeah. that are inside shoes that you can't see, much like the lacing, the, the auto lacing, and that's our first step into you know, the digitally connected uh, athlete. And uh, so like a nice broad range of things that you can visually see and appreciate as well as things that are invisible, and that's a kind of very interesting things to explore as we move forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this, whole, this room appreciates the intricacies and the designs that go into all different types of shoes. 
by many of our members. And Margo, let me pivot to you. Can you tell us a little bit about how all this translates into how to protect these innovations? What does it take to kind of think through protecting the innovations that you work so hard on? So uh, first of all, I think for, like for everyone here, I mean, we all rely on strong intellectual property systems globally. Like we can't do it ourselves. We have to kind of, the, the governments have to um, kind of come along with us and, and protect that. So uh, specifically we have, uh, I'd say about 20,000 patents, uh, 10,000 trademarks, 300 copyrights. And so we, you know, part of it is just is, um, is you know, filing. Um, and the other thing is we have, uh, you know, we have four brands. We have Nike, we have Converse, and I know there's some Converse people out here. We have Hurley, uh, and we have Jordan, and part of it is also, you know, each one of those uh, has, you know, unique intellectual property and, uh, that is, uh, you know, for them, and as well as, you know, some of the stuff that, that goes throughout the, the whole um, company. We also, so that's kind of traditionally, that's kind of the, the we have the portfolios, but also we are, because we're an innovation company, even on the legal side, we are constantly pushed to innovate. So it's not like, you know, and, and you know, you can't just rely on like trademark, for example, to try to, to um, uh, fight counterfeits. Uh, we have to also rely on, we're looking at, you know, how do, we, how do we use design patents to go after, you know, kind of counterfeit and knockoff products? How do we use copyright to go after, um, you know, artwork, uh, protection of artwork on our, on our, how do we use trade dress, which is, you know, a, a way of protecting kind of the look of something that's iconic that doesn't have a specific, you know, kind of the, in our case, like the swoosh or, or the jump man, the Jordan, like, how do we, we're constantly looking for all those areas that we can expand into, um, uh, you know, to be both innovative and, and protect the company because just can't, we can't, we can't keep still just the way kind of Mark can't keep still in terms of, of, um, of, of innovating. Right, right. And that's a big part of it, like tapping into that design side, that creative side. Mark, what's, what's been your favorite kind of design project? Is there something that stands out there that you're really proud of that, that really kind of goes to who you are as a designer? My, my favorite stuff is the stuff I can't tell you about because we're working <laughs> on it now. Uh, the most recent deliverable was uh, designing on the body in motion. We, we did a little program in, in uh, New York uh, last year where we were literally just using the tools available to us to give somebody an experience where you walk in, you put on a pair of shoes, we're projecting on your body in motion, you get to see, you get to say red, the shoes turn red, you say herringbone, uh, herringbone turns into, and just give that experience of utilizing new technologies, uh, again, uh, designing on the body in motion and having a really visceral experience. And then, and then when you say print, you know, about uh, 40 minutes later, you got a pair of shoes. And they're handmade, it's not printed on, it's like literally from the ground up, we, we built those shoes. And that was a really interesting pilot and it challenged us for a few years and it was really hard to wake up every morning and not check and see if somebody had already done it. You know, I was like, I was paranoid somebody else was gonna do it. But in the meantime, we were trying to do the best we could to. Um, you know, to own those patents, to own everything it took to be able to do that. And then now we kind of open that up to the rest of the brand to see what, what is appropriate for the rest of the brands. And, and, and tagging on your point of uh, in innovation, we uh, look at, we do have Innovation Inc., which is the four brands. Um, so it's a very unique challenge to try and uh, come up with things that haven't been done before, but then also make them appropriate for each one. It shouldn't just be good for one brand or another brand or one category, but the challenge is really doing something that is ink related that each of the brands can uh, can feed off of and do, and put their own spin on. Right, so you can incubate and then deploy that across Absolutely. all your different brands. That makes a lot of sense. Well, it's clear that you, I mean, it's a necessity, but you're creating new and innovative, innovative products, but also investing in, in legal protections. I think it's a necessity for, a growing necessity for many in this room. Um, but like many companies, I imagine there are a lot of challenges to combating counterfeits. I mean, we talked about it today with Ambassador Froman. Can you tell us about some of the difficulties and opportunities that we all have, I think, for improvements? Yeah. Um, so I'm sure lots and lots of people, lots and lots of companies in this in this room also have uh, counterfeit problems. On one sense, you know, it's a good problem to have if they're counterfeiting your shoes. So it means that, you know, that it's got some consumer heat. But on the other hand, it, you know, it's really um, challenging on the business side when people are buying fake products that are, you know, and I don't have to tell this group that. Um, 
So, you know, we find one of the, one of the challenges, we are, at least one of the challenges we're facing is one, increasingly high quality counterfeits. Um, counterfeits that are sometimes just incredibly hard, even for our experts uh, in, in, the, in the, our brand protection space to, to tell that they're counterfeit without ripping them apart and doing a complete forensic analysis, which is um, troubling. Uh, two is the small parcels that come in from kind of, uh, you know, overseas. We get, you know, it's not even they're coming in on big containers. Some of them are coming in kind of ones and twos. And so that's incredibly difficult. Uh, and the third, another challenge that we're facing is, um, and I'm sure other people do, the, our products will sometimes come in without our trademarks, separate from the trademarks, and then they put the, they put the trademarks on kind of in country, and so kind of at the border, hard to stop. Uh, products that are um, that that you know that are, don't have the aren't straight kind of trademark counterfeit. Um, one of the one of the areas, and uh, really an invitation for people to join us in this effort. One of the one of the things we're focused on, on a couple of things in the IP space is um, better information sharing with Customs and Border uh, Patrol. So really great partners. However, a lot of the information, like the more information that we can have about the seizures, about the, the bad guys, about kind of what they're doing, and in a, in a consistent format, the more that we can help elevate that information, share it back and forth, we can we share it among, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, the bad guys aren't really just working on, you know, just Nike, they're working across brands. The more that we can do that together, the better. We've had, uh, we've had, frankly, some challenges with, um, with, the, with customs wanting to, you know, being able to do that for us, uh, kind of, uh, and so, you know, the more, the more uh, partners we have in that work trying to help push that forward, the better. We really look forward to FDRA kind of taking that mantle as well, but I yep. think there's, there's just a lot of, it's good, it would be an efficiency play that would really help, I think, all of us. Yeah, so I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, we, we are focused on information sharing. We think it's a key to engagement. This problem is only going to get worse, the way in which e-commerce has exploded. And it's only going to be more important for a broader swath of our industry because because now all of our industry is more accessible globally because of e-commerce, which is a great, great tool, but it also opens up many, many of those challenges. Mark, what's it like to see one of your products as a designer <laughs> Um, when something's been knocked off, you see a counterfeit in your design, are you... It's, are you, it's, it's awesome. It's super awesome. fun. Super fun. Uh, one of <laughs> the ex tell. One of the experiences I was telling at dinner last night was that I uh, we went to the factory and uh, was there a little early and saw the table. We were there to uh, check out the latest samples of something. And the table was full of product and uh, I was kind of looking through it and going, eh, I got some stuff right and got some stuff wrong. but. You know, we'll get into the into the meat of the conversation here when everybody starts and everybody rolled into the room. And I was like, looks like you guys got a pretty good start on this one. And they're like, well, no, so you saw the counterfeit. Mm. And that's when my jaw dropped and I said I knew it was a problem, but it was really frustrating and awe-inspiring at the speed and the deft ability to reproduce uh, and even to uh, uh, finalize and finish out some of the unfinished things that we had specifically left off mm. uh, to the point where we had actually, I, I, I had to jump back and think, I think I have a pretty good eye for this kind of stuff. And I was, I was shocked and amazed. Really? So that, 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 that kind of challenges everything that we do. And I think that's, you know, even at the point of it's done before it leaves the country, before it leaves the country, you got to do something ahead of time. And that's right. why we're so you know, keen about this particular subject. And that's been, particular. I mean, that sophistication is there, right? It is. It's right there. And, you know, that's communication at every potential level. And, uh, and generally, if you're motivated by whatever uh, motivates you to do that, they're, they're figuring out ways to do it beyond, beyond our ability to track it. Right, right. Well, as an organization, we've called out specific countries where we've seen challenges and others that might be doing it right. As a global brand, you have to have kind of your own list of which countries are being proactive on intellectual property protections. Are there positive takeaways that you would like to highlight for a U.S. audience about some of the activity that's going on globally, Margo? Well, uh, potentially globally, but I think if people have read, I think uh, it was yesterday, and yesterday or today, lost count because I'm uh, traveling, but um, the, uh, the <laughs> executive order that was issued by the, the White House uh, to fight counterfeiting is a huge, I think, uh, potential opportunity. 
one that really it's like it's, it's, it's a real potential opportunity for us to strike while the iron's hot, while uh, they're like asking for information, asking what the problems are, asking for what the solutions are. And so um, I think it's an opportunity for all of us and with um, FDRA hopefully taking a, a key role in that in in coming up with some, uh, you know, solutions and, and actually getting some traction on it. Uh, one of the things besides this information sharing for us that's really important is, um, is giving Customs and Border Patrol the um, authority to seize on design patent. Um, you know, it's, it's, and that helps, bring, that would help us get the, when the products are brought in and the trademarks are applied out elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We often have design patents on the shoes and to be able to be able to enforce on design patent would be a huge win. That would bring us in line with uh, Europe and China mm -hmm. and Japan and, and uh, Mexico and others who allow that. So I think it's, I think we are really right now at a, at a tremendous uh, point for counterfeit. Uh, that we can actually do something, um, and so I'm hopeful that we can all take advantage of it. And really, again, it's an invitation to anyone. If you're interested, please, you know, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to, um, you know, would love to work with FDRA on that. But we just think it's now is now is the time. It feels like slightly hopeful, and even just you know, from the beginning of this week to now, it feels more hopeful than when I landed a couple of days ago. That's good. That's good. Not a lot of people feel hopeful if they come to yeah. DC and hang out for a little bit. Um, <laughs> I will say that one of the things we prioritize and understand is also educating policymakers, educating customs. The International Trade Commission has staff here. They come here. They're engaged. They're really hungry to understand our footwear industry from a global perspective. So it's incumbent upon us as well to educate customs about what to look for, what, you know, what would be infringing, how can we educate them. And, and I think they're, they're willing to listen, but we have, as FDRI, we'll continue to kind of Carry that, carry that mantle, if you will, and it's it's a huge priority for us. So if you're not plugged into our efforts, please see me after the show. Um, let me ask you this: Let's do a, one, a couple more questions. For many of us, um, we don't just work out or play sports; we're also huge fans. So talk about and this is to you, Mark. You guys work a ton of sports leagues. Um, can you tell us about how you design can be a part of? or play a part in designing for a specific team, or if you get a specific team that's in your mind you're going to be designing for, how does that change the dynamic as a designer? Um, we're always trying to solve problems for, for, for athletes. So uh, I, I rarely work with teams that work primarily with uh, individual athletes. And um, they represent teams. So you solve something for somebody. There's a broad swath of people who are going to appreciate those solves. Uh, most recently, I do work with Keegan Bradley on, on the PGA Tour. Uh, he's a Jordan athlete, and uh, so got a lot of Jordan history there. And um, we solve problems in unique ways for each one. And I, I keep saying it's the one thing at a time for one person. And with him, he's got really unique shaped feet and I don't think I'm going out on limb saying his feet are not really indicative of everybody else's feet. His, his architecture is very unique and so that's a great challenge. That's the fun for us is how do you give uh, them the benefit of all the knowledge and all the sports research and all the scientists and, and then the creative mix that it takes to bring that to something that they're very comfortable in performing in so there's no distraction but when they look down or when they see it um, they're uh, confident. There, there's a confidence building that comes from that. And the confidence from being almost invisible to it, uh, stay off and stay out of their purview until they need you. And then when they need you, be aware and, um, and, and available every moment of the day. Uh, I think those are the ingredients that keep it really interesting for me and, and, uh, and do challenge you know, uh, how things have been done before. We kind of want best practices, but then new, new, new uh, technologies and capabilities, materials uh, that, that keep things interesting and fresh. Uh, it is a constant uh, barrage of unique in, in ingredients that keeps things uh, fun for us. Yeah, we have a, the Washington Redskins need a lot of help with uh, performance. <laughs> and as a long-suffering fan, we'd love to have you park here for a while and help us out. Um, but it, sound, it does sound like it's not just performance from a physical standpoint, it's also emotional, it's psyche, it's, it's that confidence you talk about. That's one of the things I keep saying, you know, designers and, and creatives are, are many times uh, psychologists or shrinks. 
you have to pull <laughs> unique uh, in information out of them. Sometimes they're very uh, vocal and outward about what they feel. You have to interpret that into a physical design. You know, you're taking the ethos and pulling it in and uh, re responding. And, and over time, you, know, you build a relationship with somebody, they trust you a little bit more. And uh, yeah, you come up with graphics or storytelling, little icons, things that they feel personally invested in. It's not just, hey, we're gonna put a swoosh or a Jumpman or a H or a Converse star on it or something. We're just, we're actually putting you, we're embedding your, your personal DNA into it. And that really goes a long way. And, and, and we always say you have to, the, the door in is you have to solve the issues and make them comfortable and perform at the highest level. And then the icing on that is just making it something that they're just proud to show and, show, and, and, and when they're representing that uh, at a high level, they're, they're your, your greatest ally in communicating every part of that. Yeah, telling the brand story yeah. indeed. Um, speaking of telling a brand story, retail experience is so key to these days to consumers, how you feel when you go into a, a retail outlet. We spend a lot of time talking about uh, ways in which companies are evolving in that space. Uh, let's talk about innovation design that goes into the retail experience. Your store in Manhattan is unbelievable. I've been there many a times, even since it just opened not too long ago. I kid you not, uh, just a personal story real quick, humor me. My parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary in December. They're from Alabama. Harper Lee was my grandmother's neighbor. So To Kill a Mockingbird is a huge part of who we are as a family. And so we gave my parents an all expense paid trip to New York to see To Kill a Mockingbird on on Broadway last night. So I texted my, I texted my mom yesterday to see how I was going. She says, day was wonderful. We went to the new Nike store and I got me my, I love my Pegasus, man. They're 71. We got the new, I got, the store is unbelievable. They had the Pegasus I want. And I was like, that's my mom, Nike fan through and through. Um, Good, keep so, it that way. Yeah, so thanks for hearing me on that story. But it, it just speaks to that experience that no matter what age you are, when you walk in that store, it hits you in the face that something special is going on here. So talk to me about the innovations that go into the retail experience. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, um, I would encourage anybody who's in New York or uh, Shanghai. Uh, I was at the, I haven't been to the New York store, but I've been to the Shanghai store. And I think for, for me, it's the first time that we have truly integrated digital and retail together in a way that feels natural and seamless and it's really something to see and it's really something to experience. I mean, from there's, you know, things that you play on in the store digitally, there's designing product, there's the, you know, paint, like the way you select and pay and look for things. I mean, it's just, it's kind of throughout. It's really, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a really, but it doesn't feel extra. It feels natural and super energizing. Um, I've just, you know, it's, it's really cool. Uh, so it just if people have an opportunity, uh, I would encourage them. And, you know, and so glad to hear about your yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. story. It's awesome. No, no. Yeah, I think anytime you can break the, the boundary between, you know, this, this uh, commerce transaction, um, I always just look at it through an eye, you know, of a six-year-old or something. Is like I would rather go play somewhere and then just have to pay for it and yeah. have the the reason yeah. I'm there is is fun versus just I got to go get those shoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part. I, mean, I think you said it. it's a seamless uh, experience and it's super super cool. Yeah, yeah, it's just fun. It's just fun. Yeah, it is fun. So with that, what closing thoughts do you have as we think about how to wrap this up? This discussion up on IP and. What, what are kind of some inspirational marching orders that we can all think about as an organization to go out there and, and fight, fight these challenges, but also do it in a productive and economically advantage, you know, advantage to our economics as well? Well, I would just, I'm just going to repeat it. I just feel like, especially with the executive order this week, I feel like this is a moment uh, in time that we can seize. Um, and the more people that seize it, the better together. Because I think we're, you know, this is not a competitive uh, issue. This is one that, you know, people can join together. And the more people that we can join and get after a couple of key things, I think the more successful we will be. And I do feel optimistic right now that there is some momentum that we can we can actually get something done. So um, that's my that's my parting uh, thought again. Cool. <laughs> I know you guys have a tight time frame. I can't thank you enough, Margo and Mark. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Please help me in thanking both of them. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. So, uh, so that was the, the talk about some of the things Nike's working on and, and how they strategically work on IP issues. So I think 
I think it's really insightful because sometimes we just think of end product, right? Protecting end product, right? Brand trademark infringement, things like that. But but they're actually saying we need to, to go all the way at the very beginning and make sure that we have a, a firm process to protect from start to end. So hopefully uh, the folks who are listening today, thank you for listening. But hopefully you got something out of that. It makes you think a little bit differently about IP issues and how to how to think about it in the 21st century. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, well, with that, uh, if you have any comments on this episode, if you have ideas for future episodes, um, topics, issues that you're dealing with or speakers you think would be great to have on the show, um, please drop us a line. We're at shoeandshow.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Um, drop us a line on any of those feeds, and we'll get that and respond back to you. Um, but thank you very much for listening. And until next time, on behalf of Jasmine, this is Andy Polk, and Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit fdra.org.